Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to day two of the Global Education Conference. We're just so delighted to have Ann Godina here with Eva and Bushra, they're her guests. Um, I'm going to turn the time directly over to them. Thanks. Go ahead. Thank you, Steve. Thanks to you and Lucy for having us as keynote speakers for the 2019 Global Education Conference. We are thrilled to be here and we're thrilled to be talking about a topic that is very close to us, and um, that is the leadership of education for girls and for women. I'm going to speak for just a few minutes to get us started. I will tell a little bit about myself and then Dr. Bushra and Dr. Eva uh, will continue on about themselves. And we've prepared some, some dialogue that we hope that you find to be really interesting. So I am an associate professor of education leadership at Millersville University in Pennsylvania in the United States. And here I teach courses in the master's and doctoral program in education leadership. Uh, and I teach this to teachers and to principals, all of them wanting to, to progress as leaders. Um, myself, in terms of girls' education, I've had a long history with this. I went to girls' education. I was a product of girls' education uh, from kindergarten through 12th grade. And what has attracted me to this topic is, is that I have had so many wonderful mentors. Uh, of course, my mother, first of all, uh, was a wonderful mentor and, and role model to me, but also just teachers and professors uh, who I had uh, Dr. Marilyn Mason, the late Dr. Marilyn Mason at the University of Michigan, uh, so so tremendous in my life. And so I've had these role models of what does it look like to be a leader in a woman in education, whether that be in uh, leadership of education, in music, in English, all different, different areas. Uh, but at the same time, I've had wonderful male mentors, and I, I don't want to discredit that. Uh, and these male mentors have so encouraged me and and allowed me the space to grow as a woman and a woman leader in education. And there are just too many of them to, to name. I uh, would also like to thank my university and my college and my wonderful colleagues here in the Education Foundation Department, again, for supporting me as a woman in education and a woman leader. And, and through all of these people, uh, over many years, I have developed a voice, I think, and a, an ability to lead uh, in a way that has been been good. So uh, after going through girls education, I went back. I went back to that very same school as the principal and I found that there were girls needing encouragement, needing a role model on how to be a woman and, and how to lead at, at that uh, that level and how to, to learn. And um, you know we know from research that, that girls do very well in an educational environment and they do very well in an all girls environment in part because they can assume every role they do everything and so as a principal in a girls school i gave girls every opportunity and they took it they're so anxious to take it they they would never take a back seat as we say in the states they would never step back but they would always step forward to develop a voice and and their voice was powerful uh, we know and of course, I wouldn't be a college professor if I didn't talk about research. So <laughs> we know from research that, that women thrive in education and that when one woman is educated, it benefits her family financially. It benefits her community. And, and that just continues to grow. And when we <coughs> educate many women and we allow many women to be leaders, then our society thrives. So women's right in education is as much education's right to have women there and such a, such a key role that they play. And this is nothing new. Um, but despite all of this, all of this research, all of these many wonderful examples like Dr. Busha and Dr. Eva, women face resistance to their education. And, and this is true, I've seen it around the world. Uh, here in the United States, I see undermining of women sometimes very small acts, things that can't be prosecuted by law or in a court, but things that are a detriment to women, things that discourage them. And these behaviors come from not only men, but from women too, which would seem to be very, very ironic. You would think women would want to have women leaders, but what we know is that it feels and looks different to have a woman leader in education. You know, we talk differently as women. We act differently, we have different solutions, and sometimes different 
whether you're a man or a woman, different feels wrong. And so because there's a difference, we think that, oh, this is not right. This woman, she's not a leader because, because she's different. And, and we give stereotypical remarks as to, oh, well, she, she must be pregnant. That's why she's acting that way. Well, no, it's because it's the right decision to be made. And so amidst all of this encouragement, we have some discouragement. And, and yet what we see from women is this perseverance. We see so much hope. We see so many gains here in the United States. We have a, a new dean at Harvard in the Graduate School of Education, a woman, an African-American woman. And recently we've had a woman run to be president of the United States. And even though she was not successful, we now have more women stepping up uh, to, to, to lead, whether it's in education or other areas. So one of the things I'm so interested in is what makes them tick? What makes these women continue on in a way that is just so, so remarkable? What do they have in common? What are their unique characteristics that, that they have that have enabled them to be so, so successful? And so I've kind of been on this quest, right, to, to discover this and, and hopefully share it. Because, again, we know that if girls have a relatable role model as a woman, that they're more likely to be educated and they're more likely to be successful. So I'd like to just share briefly a, a book that I recently published, uh, just so that you can see this, about a remarkable woman in, in Italy who has saved music education in Italy. We think of Italy as being a place that is so um, known for music, and uh, it is for hundreds of years. But what we also know is that there has been a lack of leadership for education of children and women in music. And Joan Yaki came forward as a leader over the last several decades to completely change that. So if you're looking for an interesting book about a woman leader, this is, is one. Again, I, I, uh, I'm glad to share this book with you that I wrote. Also, we have some chapters about Mary Parker Follett, very famous American woman, I'll show that as well, who worked in uh, the field of social work. But intersected with education and, and was a brave woman to speak up and say, here is what must happen in education and to lay a pathway on how that is to take place. So you see, even myself, I have had so many, <laughs> many role models. Uh, but now for the, the most important people for today, I uh, am so pleased to introduce to you uh, Dr. Evangeline Aruselvi Whitehead and Dr. Bushra Rahim. I've been acquainted with them through a journal that I founded and edited. It's called the Excellence in Education Journal, uh, www.excellenceineducationjournal.org. And over time, I've been just amazed at what they are doing in their areas. So I'll read just some brief introductions and then, then they get to talk and they will be far more interesting, I'm sure, than anything I have said. So uh, dear Dr. Bushra Rahim is a folk right hero and a core member in Women's Leadership Network in Pakistan. Dr. Rahim is an Aus aide and Fulbright scholar and a Charles Willis Fowler fellow. She received her PhD in education policy from the State University of New York, Albany, Masters in Education Administration from the University of New England in Australia. She is a career and civil servant, social entrepreneur, researcher, and social activist and she has been very instrumental in her country with several reforms, including school-based management and the successful modeling of performance-based budgeting, coupled with an inbuilt accountability framework called independent monitoring systems. She currently serves as the deputy director of home and tribal affairs for the government in Pakistan. Welcome to Dr. Bushra Rahim. Dr. Eva Araselvi Whitehead is an Associate Professor of Education in English and has served in a college in Daman, Saudi Arabia from 2011 to 2016 and the English Language Center of Taif University at Mecca province in Saudi Arabia. She has also served as Associate Professor in the English Language Institute of the Princess Noura University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. She is a language specialist who received her PhD in English education. She has a master's in English education and also public administration, counseling, 
and psychotherapy. Dr. Eva is a certified cognitive behavioral therapist and psychologist, and she's recognized as a guide and author. Uh, altogether, she has written over 17 books in education that are being used by more than 700 colleges of education and universities in the country of India. In addition to this, she has served as a school principal and a leader. She's a life member of the India Association for Education Research, the Academy of Registered Psychotherapists, the Association of Social Psychologists, and the Indian Society for Technical Education. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Rahim and welcome Dr. Arusalvi. Thank you, Dr. Ann. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ann. So we would like to talk with you today to find out many ideas around this idea of leading women's and girls' education because you have both been so instrumental in your countries and your stories are stories that the world needs to hear and so we're excited to share that. So let me ask you first, um, could you tell us a little bit about your insights of your role, how you are leading and advocating for inclusive education for women and girls? And maybe we will start with Dr. Eva first and then Dr. Bushra. So Dr. Eva. Uh, respected ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and honor to be a tiny part of this 2019 Global Education Conference. I thank Dr. Anne Gardino for inviting me to present my educational thoughts representing girls and women's education in India and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, inclusion to me is a continuous process as a professor and basically as a teacher, I strengthen and sustain the participation of all students, teachers, parents, and community members in the work of the educational institution. As a constructor of curriculum, I provide an accessible curriculum and appropriate training programs for all students and teachers. I restructure the practices of culture and policies in the schools to respond to the diversity of people within the locality of the educational institutions. I educate my students and teachers to fulfill constitutional responsibilities to develop a healthy citizenship, to develop a feeling of self-respect, to use modern technology, and to be self-reliant and social equality. Uh, the common problems faced by the students in the regular classrooms are inferiority complex, inferiority complex, lack of understanding, adjustment problems, isolated and segregated feelings, feelings of insecurity, lack of expression, shyness, lack behind in studies, considering studies as overburden and introvert behavior. To help my students overcome these problems, I interact with the parents periodically to know more about the students and help them overcome their problems by introducing new, new learning strategies. I look after the special needs and serve accordingly. I always have one-to-one -one meeting with my students to understand them personally in a very friendly manner and to have focus group to develop self-confidence. I recognize the hidden talents and showcase their abilities in various programs and activities. On the whole, I prepare my students to develop self-confidence, uh, inculcate positive attitude, develop brotherhood, and improve quality of education. As an advocate for inclusive education, I use some teaching strategies in my classrooms. I use cooperative learning, peer tutoring, multi-sensory teaching to the student teachers, project-based learning using the real life scenario, technologies in the classroom like uh, Quizlet and uh, uh, Kahoot, and analysis of emotions, all these things. Uh, and also crossover uh, learning like using club activities and field visits. In my experience, there are certain barriers to achieve inclusive education uh, in a full swing in India. Uh, I realize the textbooks must be really improved. Uh, physical uh, uh, facilities and infrastructure of the classrooms must be improved. Uh, but this is already achieved in the classrooms of Saudi Arabia. Uh, but in India, there is a lack of trained teachers, so that special training must be given to the teachers. And definitely, there must be a great improvement in the methods of teaching, of course, and resources and funds should be raised. And social and gender discriminations must be completely put up. So I'm doing this in my classrooms as an advocate for inclusive education. Yeah. 
Thank you, Dr. Eva, so very inspiring. Dr. Bushra, same question to you. How have you led and advocated for inclusive education of women and girls in your country? Um, thank you, Dr. Ann, for having me. And thank you, Steve and Lucy. And uh, um, hello to all the participants who are viewing this uh, conference. Um, uh, just like you said in the introduction, as a civil servant, I remained involved in uh, multiple reforms. Um, two major reforms related to education sector are, just like you said, school-based management, or what we call it, parent-teacher councils here in Pakistan. And the second reform is performance-based budgeting. Um, under the parent-teacher council reforms, we devolved autonomy to all the government schools so they can spend the budget on need basis. Um, we faced a lot of resistance from the stakeholders. Um, however, we were able to implement the reform, which is still there. Under performance-based budget, we moved away from incremental form of budgeting to allocating budget on the performance of schools. Uh, my second role is uh, as a co-founder of a non-for-profit organization, which is called Development Agent for Change. Um, in that organization, we are involved in uh, mostly advocacy campaigns related to political participation of women, um, women economic empowerment, enrollment of out-of-school children, and child protection, to name a few. Uh, my third role is um, uh, a social entrepreneur. Um, I lead a nonprofit organization, which is called Association of Business Professional and Agricultural Women. Um, in that uh, setup, we are working for girls' education, um, adult literacy, women economic empowerment, and run advocacy campaign on education, environment, and health. Um, we have established community schools for girls and women skill development centers, which is funded by uh, mutual collaborations and donations. We don't receive fund from uh, international or national organizations. It is run purely on charity basis. Um, we have recently launched um, reading story books in public schools through volunteers from local universities, which is a roaring success. Um, another, my, another my role is uh, as a president of Fulbright Alumni Association in which we do um, scholarship awareness programs, um, events on interfaith harmony and uh, book reading drives and things like that. So this is a little bit about me and uh, my role as an advocate for inclusive education. Thank you, Dr. Bushra. I hear in both of you so much encouragement and so much hope, and you've done so many remarkable things in your countries, and yet we know there are challenges. So that, that's my next question for you is, what are the challenges to educating girls in developing economies, India, Pakistan, and why is it important to address these? So maybe we'll start this prompt first with Dr. Bushra and then Dr. Eva. Dr. Bushra. Um, actually, Pakistan has taken some uh, commendable steps over the last few years to improve K-12 education, and here we call it uh, elementary and secondary education. Um, some of the steps taken are like devolving education to provinces under 18th Constitutional Amendment in 2010, uh, promulgation of right to compulsory education, uh, cash transfer programs for secondary school girls, uh, public-private partnership and things like that. Um, however, there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of access, quality, and equity. Let me explain it further to you. Um, there are 65 million children of school-going age in the country, of which 22 million are not attending schools, and two-thirds of them are girls. We have fewer number of girls primary and secondary schools than boys. So if you look at the distribution of those who are in the schools, which is 43 million, you would visualize a pyramid. Nearly 10.7 million boys and 8.6 million girls are enrolled at the primary level. And you know this drops to just 3 million and 2 million girls at the lower secondary level. So you can imagine the high rates of dropouts between primary and lower secondary level. Um, 
the challenges to educating girls can be divided uh, into supply side and demand side constraints. The supply side uh, constraints are one, there are insufficient number of schools. So there are 79,000 boys primary schools in Pakistan as compared to 42,000 girls primary schools. And middle and high schools are further lower than the primary schools. So the girls, middle and high schools are just 16,000 as compared to 79,000 boys primary schools. And there are just 18,000 boys middle schools as compared to uh, uh, 79,000 boys schools and uh, 42,000 girls schools. So you can understand uh, we are short of schools in Pakistan, especially for girls. The second issue is overcrowded classrooms. Um, the policy of one teacher uh, for 40 students is used at primary and middle level. Uh, however, in uh, my province, which is Khyber Pukhtunkhwa, 39% of government schools have a student teacher ratio of more than 40 into 1. 39% of government schools have fewer teachers. Similarly, in Sin, this figure is as high as 47%. So with student to teacher ratio as high as 80 to 90 or 100 students to a teacher, classroom management issues uh, abound. And uh, hyper classroom enrollment required an introduction of teaching assistants. So we are severely short of teachers and we have overcrowded classrooms. Third major issue for girls is significant home to uh, school distance. Um, you know, the benchmark to construct a middle school in Pakistan is that there should be four to five primary schools in that area, and then one middle school is con constructed, uh, which implies, of course, larger house to school distances. In rural areas, traveling long distances are insecure for girls, so which necessitate the use of transportation. Otherwise, when girls walk on foot and if God forbid anything happens, someone harass uh, a girl or something, she's asked to stay at home and leave the school. Um, another important issue is poor quality of education. The learning outcomes in public sector schools are not up to the mark. So according to a household survey in rural Punjab, 72% of class three kids cannot read a story in Urdu, which is our national language. And similarly, the st statistics for um, reading uh, sentences is uh, significant. It's 93% class three children cannot read class two level sentences. Um, another important issue is uh, lack of school resources, by which I mean uh, we don't have requisite number of classrooms or other infrastructure facilities like bathrooms or uh, potable water. On the demand side, I would like to say that the major issues are poverty, um, lack of parental support, and cultural approach to girls' education. So these are some of the major issues that girls face here in Pakistan. Thank you, Dr. Bushra. Dr. Eva. Yeah. Uh, Al Gurd, former vice president of the United States says, population growth is straining the earth's resources to the breaking point and educating girls is the single most important factor in stabilizing that plus helping women gain political and economic power and safeguarding their reproductive rights. Okay, I agree with that. Education, educating a girl is one of the best investments her family, community, and country can make. Uh, over the last 25 years, there have been large gains in girls' education, and we, uh, as a global community, can appreciate ourselves really for the real progress that has been made. Our governments and the educational institutions, international organizations, media and non-governmental organizations are doing remarkable improvements in girls' education. Despite this progress, the research data shows that there are hot spots in the world and especially countries in Africa, Middle East, uh, South Asia and especially in India are home to the widest gender gaps in enrollment. To ex ex 
uh, to examine why girls are behind these hotspots. We begin with the girl as a family at the center, and also the norms, resources, and the economy are often instruments for perpetuating this gender inequality. I am going to uh, put my points in a nutshell. The first point is schooling is more costly for girls. In India, especially, the direct costs are school fees, uniforms, books, and transportation. Many non-experimental studies using household survey data finds that girls' schooling is more sensitive to cost and time that girls spend working or helping family. Uh, the second point is early marriage and teen pregnancy keep girls out of school. Today, one in three girls in low and middle income countries continue to be married before the age of 18. And one in nine girls are married before their 15th birthday. According to the UNICEF uh, uh, data, 47% of girls are married by 18 years of age, and 18% of girls are married by 15 years of age. And child marriage imposes heavy costs for girls socially, physically and emotionally and undermines all efforts taken to improve girls' education. And the, the, the next challenge is pervasive uh, school-related violence harms millions of girls and young women. Uh, this violence ranges from extreme acts such as kidnapping, bombing, maiming and killing, acts which often occurs in context of armed conflict, militancy and political violence. And in 15 countries around the world are directly targeted at girls. I can say uh, Malala in Pakistan and uh, Chibuk girls in Nigeria. And restricted space and uh, expectations limits girls' education to reap the returns uh, to education. Lack of women's participation in political affairs is high in many places. Survey says that there are many places where no women had even been the local leader. 86% of mm -hmm. parents wanted their daughters to be either a housewife or whatever their in-laws would decide for her, compared with less than 1% of their sons. And illiteracy or ignorance of people also a constraint in the empowerment of women and lack of decision-making authority and many customs and cultural practices hidden the empowerment of women. For example, many parents do not send their daughters to schools when they attain puberty, and this practice is still persists in many uh, remote villages of India. And lack of overall awareness in general, and particularly lack of knowledge in technology, hinders the progress in education. And inadequate and unorganized healthcare delivery systems disturbs girls' education. And lack of high quality and gender sensitive curricula and learning materials are all challenges of girls' education. While I talk about girls' education in this century, India witnessed one of the highest female infanticide incidents in the world. And also the female feticide is another major issue in India. Indian government has taken special actions against these two issues, and now it is completely under control. According to the ACHR report, ultrasound for prenatal determination of sex can be done for as low as 2.6 US dollars, Ultrasound and abortion can be done for about $150 of this. To be born as a girl child and to live as a girl in this society itself is a major problem. Dowry system in South Asia, which makes daughters an unaffordable economic burden, also contributes to female infanticide. Girls are not safe and girls from poverty striking families are even more vulnerable. They are often subjected to different kinds of harm, neglect, violence in the form of abuse, harassment, domestic violence, rape, etc. So education is an important tool that enables women and girls to participate in decisions that affect their lives and in improving their social status. And it's very important to address these problems here to elicit special attention and to create great awareness uh, amongst the educationalists who are listening to me here and those who are witnessing this session throughout the world. More educated girls and women as per uh, to become leaders and thus expand a country's leadership and entrepreneurial talent. Economic growth is faster when girls learn. Education opens doors for opportunities for young women, especially when they cannot count on family, wealth, property, or business connections. Women with more years of schooling are more likely to find employment uh, and own and operate productive forms of films and earn high 
uh, higher wages. So it's our responsibility and duty uh, to face all the challenges and uh, help uh, these girls to have proper education and non-formal education and all these things. Thank you, Dr. Eva. I'd like for us to take just a few minutes and bring together some of your ideas here uh, that you've expressed. And uh, this will go a little uh, off of our uh, prompts that we talked about, but I think it's, it's worth taking a few minutes just to have some open discussion. Because you've both, again, you've both done so much for girls' education in your countries and to lead the education of girls and, and women you are the relatable role model that girls seek and that girls inspire to. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your, your story um, and specifically, you know, what, what do you see as the solution in terms of helping more girls to get educated? You know, what are some specific things that you have done or things that you think you still want to do, that you aspire to do, that will improve the education for girls. So I open that up to either Dr. Busha or Eva, whoever would like to respond. Eva, would you like to talk on this? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so as a professor and as an educationalist, I would like to uh, reach the downtrodden uh, children and, uh, and the girls in India and also in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru uh, once pointed out, to awaken the people, it is women who must be awakened. Uh, once she is on the move, the family moves and the village moves and the nation moves. So the first is, uh, I'm insisting the changing attitude of women. The first and the foremost factor which can lead to empowering women is that there must be change in the attitude of women. Empowerment should come from within. Women must empower themselves by changing their attitude. Women should realize that opportunities will not land in their hands. They must create them. They should fight to restore their dignified position in the society. They should thrive hard to enforce their rights and establish due justice and equality in the society. Uh, they themselves should work hard for the elimination of illiteracy, poverty, dowry ills, and thus women have to empower themselves by changing their status. Um, I can give some data uh, that is, women today do not need just a basic education. Also, I insist non formal education or function oriented uh, education that uh, would uh, equip them to take up challenging jobs so that. They can uh, enjoy economic uh, independence and deliver them from under domination by others. It can be used as a tool to bridge the gender gap. So uh, this uh, UNESCO conference in 1962 underlined the importance of the uh, access of girls and women to technical occasional education. So as a professor, I am not only uh, entertaining education to the students, they should be uh, learning some vocational education also for the economic and social development. And uh, uh, emphasis is strongly laid by the Indian government on enrollment and retention of the girl child in formal schools and non-formal education and through incentive schemes such as midday meals, free supply of textbooks, uniforms, school bags, and science kits, scholarship, residential and hotel, hostel facilities. So uh, we are changing curriculum according to the needs of the children. And also we are giving it a non-formal way and we give a proper curriculum is formal education and also we introduce non-formal education. And also we give entrepreneurial training uh, to the students and to the women forum. And this business training opportunities uh, uh, and greater confidence in negotiating the bureaucracies of the government. And also we try to eliminate gender discrimination and it is uh, now uh, slowly uh, been uh, put off in India. And uh, we encourage development programs as an educator, uh, we uh, request the governments and the uh, uh, non-profitable organizations to conduct uh, some knowledgeable uh, workshops and uh, seminars to educate the ladies or uh, to have uh, education and also let their family members to have a family ladies to have education and these are as uh, and we do some research also in this area and uh, give them 
uh, very personal uh, attention and care to them and we have personal meeting with the ladies and also we introduce uh, uh, the the help of mass media uh, we project and propagate women related issues and create great awareness particularly about women empowerment so these are the things we do as i do along with the government sectors in india so um in uh, in my opinion what we can do to enhance uh, in addition to enhancing educational opportunities um i think for rural girls uh, who need support from parents and in addition to that they need psychosocial support which is very important life skills training exposure to mentors and relatable role models are other ways that can empower women um access to female counselors who are adept at teaching girls important life skills such as negotiating gender barriers while remaining committed to getting education and economic independence is also crucial um for urban girls who belong to educated families and have support from their families career counseling and mentorship programs are very crucial um let me share a um a story um i visited a rural village um in khyber pakhtunkhwa and uh, um when i was talking to those girls in connection with connecting those artisans with the markets i saw a girl who seemed very confident and who seemed like she was a little bit educated and i asked her why you are not continuing your education and why you are uh, just learning this skill um she said that my uncle is not allowing me to enroll in grade 9 and i asked her why uh, so she said that ask my uncle and i'm begging him that i uh, need to continue my education and uh, but he and uh, especially he and my father they are not allowing me so uh, i asked her to introduce me to her uncle and uh, father and uh, so that i can uh, uh, encourage them to uh, let you go to school um when i met uh, her uncle and father and i um, asked her, uh, them that uh, uh, see education is so much important and look at me and look at uh, my other team members who are so educated and now we are here in rural areas and now we are um imparting literacy to rural women and we are imparting these skills these handicrafts so that they can be economically empowered so why not you are allowing your daughter and your niece to continue uh, uh, her education um so uh, they were of course very uh, like uh, um kind of uh, regarded me uh because of my work and uh, because i belong to that area so luckily like they um, approved my request and they allowed her to continue her education so i think this is very important that uh, um instead of just asking the girls to continue education we should build a support system we should uh, provide a psychosocial support system for those girls because uh, one of our parents or both our, of our parents uh, they don't allow us to continue education so uh, family pressure or pressure from mentors or role models is ex- extremely important so that girls can continue their education so this is my take on this that's so interesting it's, i guess we could say it's a small world as an elementary principal at a, an all girls school i had had very similar things uh, not so much about why girls should continue their education but why their education should continue at an all girls school and i would have fathers that would come up to me and say oh well i know you don't like men here well no that had nothing to do with it but we just created this atmosphere in which girls could be so successful um at the ella school and and they were and they and they have uh, for many years and continue to be successful but i think we have in our society and it's sounding like it's not just the united states but we have this uh people really just thinking that that girls education is not such a a good thing uh which leads me really to my my next question for for both of you and that is um in addition to enhancing education opportunities uh, you know as we've talked about are there other things that we can be doing 
to empower women, to empower girls. And so I'll put that out to both Dr. Eva and Dr. Bushra, whoever might like to respond. So may I go ahead? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I think it is important to have relatable role models. Uh, just like I said earlier that uh, psychosocial support is uh, important and it is very important just like you said in your uh, introductory speech that relatable role models are very crucial for building aspiration and hope amongst girls. So what happens in Pakistan here is that women are told that they are not capable of doing uh, anything because they are women. Um, it is perceived that uh, uh, women become too headstrong and irrepressible and if they get education um, they would become free thinking and they start seeing themselves as the equals of men and uh, uh, women start mingling with men who are strangers to them which is giving birth to immorality and that is why you know the number of women aged 20 to uh, 34 um, having secondary education who are active in the workforce is just 3.8 percent in Pakistan so it is very important to um, challenge deeply embedded social and cultural norms to unlock opportunities for women. And you know, like these cultural and uh, uh, social norms, they are in clash with the Islamic teachings. Um, the first wife of our uh, last prophet, peace be upon him, she was a businesswoman and our holy prophet used to support her in her business. So the question arises is that uh, who can be a role model um, what I would suggest is that strong role models can be people at household, just like you mentioned, local, uh, national or international level. Um, at household level, a strong mother can be a role model who stands up against domestic abuse or faces the arts to educate her uh, daughters. At local level, um, like you mentioned, uh, teachers can be role models um, as the success experienced by them is attainable and replicable. Um, at national and international level, who, women who are athletes, uh, community leaders, uh, successful business women, celebrities, um, confident peers, or any strong women uh, whose presence will resonate with the girls can be role models. Um, and you know, some of the studies conducted in India, uh, they found out that after seeing a minimum of two female chiefs, um, parents were more likely to want their daughter to study past secondary school. So this is the importance of role model. Other studies have concluded that there is a strong correlation between women with role models and women with leadership goals. Um, so these are some of the studies. And then again, I would narrate uh, uh, um, a story recently that happened in uh, connection with the social work that I do. Um, one of our female volunteers visited a government girls' schools in Peshawar, where I live, in connection with reading storybooks to breed three girls to establish their connection with books and improve their reading skills. Um, one day she was reading the story of an astronaut and she asked the children what they want to become in the future. Um, a significant number of girls responded that they want to be medical doctors and very few said they want to be teachers. And you know, just, just one girl said she wants to be an artist and just one girl said that she wants to be an engineer. Um, so this instance indicates that there is a depth of role models for these girls and hence they should be exposed to more relatable uh, role models for, from diverse professions so they can aspire to become like them. Uh, so this is uh, my take on this question. Yes, uh, the world is full of inspiring women whose passion, work, uh, and impact in their community and courageous to choose a specific field of study, follow a certain career path and become economically empowered. Uh, you know, role models are important for the development of professional identity, personal growth and career success as they provide a source of learning, uh, motivation, self-identification and career guidance. Uh, typically, people get inspired to do something when they see others like them do it. Uh, you know, when women see other women in roles, they find it easier to imagine themselves in those roles and are more likely to put themselves forward. In addition, when they see women in leadership positions, they are most likely to speak up themselves. Female students are more likely to choose a major 
when they are assigned a female professor instead of a male one. I myself experienced this with my female researchers who work under my guidance. Retention of junior level female employees is highly correlated with the number of female supervisors. So models are really, role models are really a great impact and uh, you know, students are really following the role models, the best role models and the teacher's duty uh, is to uh, present them a role model and also uh, being as a good role model to them. And apart from, uh, I would like to uh, few, say a few role models, one or two uh, in India and Saudi Arabia. Uh, apart from Mother Teresa, you know, uh, Mother Teresa very well, and Indira Gandhi, the one and only female Prime Minister of India, Alkal and Kalpana Chawla, the first women of Indian origin uh, to venture into space as an astronaut. I can bring hundreds of living female role models here. Uh, but I'm going to say only one or two. Uh, the first one is Indira Noe. She is the Indian-born American businesswoman. And she made the world sit up and take notice when she became the CEO of the world's uh, second largest corporate corporation in the world. I have noticed many Saudi girls uh, uh, and also my Indian students are really um, seeing this Indira Nui as their role model to become best person, best women uh, in the world. And the other one is Sanjikta uh, Parashkar. Uh, he's an Indian police. She's an IPS. Yeah. And uh, she is the only Iron Lady of Assam, and is the first woman to have been appointed as IPS officer in Assam. Uh, and you know, she has arrested over 64 militants and take down 16 of them, and she has also seized tons of arms and ammunition. So Sanjikta is known to be a dedicated and courageous officer, best known for fighting terrorism, corruption, and crime against women. So in my classrooms, I, I always introduce these uh, ladies to my students and they observe something and they take good points from them. Um, so definitely role models are very useful uh, to the career lift up of uh, the ladies, the students, lady students. Thank you. We have just a few minutes left and so we want to kind of bring some ideas together but both of you reminded me of a favorite quote I've had for so many years uh, by Gustave Apollinaire, a French writer, and he said, come to the edge and the people said, we're afraid. And again he said, come to the edge and again the people said, we're afraid. So he said one more time, come to the edge and he pushed them and they flew. So you are both flying, flying in so many wonderful ways. And I'm wondering who has, who has pushed you? Who has motivated you? Who are your role models? So just very briefly, because we have only a few minutes left. Yeah. With Dr. Eva. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, uh, this teaching journey has started uh, because of my mom. Uh, she is a strong lady with a firm conviction that all women should have economic independence because it gives them confidence, a sense of self-worth, and also positively impacts the attitude of those around her. Uh, you know, my uh, passion for teaching is noticed by my mom at my younger age. When she noticed me while playing, I used to talk to, uh, take the role of a teacher, teaching to my toys and plants, and in various circumstances, assuming them as my students. Uh, from then onwards, my mom, who was also a teacher and headmistress of a school, guided me to enter into the wonderful field of uh, teaching. My best role model and inspiration was uh, uh, Sarva Pillai Radha Krishnan, uh, who was the first vice president and second president of India. He was also a philosopher and introduced uh, the thinking of Western idealist philosophers into Indian thought. He was a famous teacher and his birthday is celebrated as Teacher's Day in India. Uh, I, uh, he inspired me a lot. And according to the words of William Arthur Wood, the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, and the great teacher inspires. And several faculty members have had an enormous impact on my education uh, and life goals. But I should definitely mention Dr. Rachel Jibraj, who taught me research methodology and educational statistics. In fact, she has created a passion and laid a strong foundation for research methodology on educational statistics. She has created a fire in my heart on this subject, and she always motivated me to search and research. 
she was thorough in her subject and she knew how to actively engage as the student teachers in research methodology and other subjects getting us to problem solve and persist with challenges she used to give us inspirational classroom projects and tasks that help us see research and statistics as beautiful subjects her passion and her dedication to her work inspired me to pursue higher education and a career in research if i am good in research methodology and being a role model to my research scholars it's because what dr rachel uh, taught me in my undergraduation uh, of education my another inspiring professor uh, was dr rao she taught me methods of teaching english at st christopher's college of education chennai in 1988 she was unconventional original and inspiring constantly inventing her own teaching materials to teach english in a very very interesting way and she was brilliant at communicating her learning and her enthusiasm she was my role model to become an english teacher in the college of education actually all my role models made me strongly believe the cred of eve uh, you set your sights far and the intention to do hard work is strong your feet will carry you there it is to this belief that i attribute all my accomplishments till today and my passion to teach and research further life for me is a dynamic process demanding to search research and to innovate always i believe on the fact if a woman want to do something she will find a way otherwise she will find an excuse <laughs> so these are my role models i am still believing and really i am i'm really i'm really appreciating them because of them i'm here as a teacher thanks to god also all right eva <laughs> i'll give a short answer <laughs> i think because we are short of time yes. um, so my own academic and professional trajectory is non linear um i was bullied i was body shamed i was abused and people called me names however i accepted those challenges in early years of uh, identical and turned to reading books to find answers to why me um i was fortunate that my mother uh, supported uh, girls education we are four sisters and she supported us and for that she put her marital status uh, um uh, uh is uh, for uh, on a risk uh, because uh, her husband wanted to leave her just because she wanted to educate her daughters so um i was fortunate that my female teachers at school and college they used to support me and calm me down when i joined workforce i had a mentor who put trust in me despite the fact that i was the only woman in the ministry that at that time and uh, who challenged my capabilities and who involved me in every official assignment um for the first time when i went to australia on scholarship um uh, which was the first time i had stepped out of home without a chaperon um i was homesick uh, but i can vividly recall that by reading the autobiography of our ex prime minister uh, mohtarma benazir bhutto um i would console myself by saying that this time would pass soon um luckily the professors they were extremely friendly and uh, they accepted me with open arms i'm still in contact with uh, them and especially we are col- uh, i'm collaborating with my one of my female pro- professors um uh and we are writing an article on entrepreneurship similarly when i went to the us uh, on a fulbright scholarship the entire teaching faculty was cooperative and uh, uh, i am in contact with those professors till date um uh, similarly when i submitted my research paper to international journal of excellence i found dr ann who is extremely supportive and my contact with her resulted in in this collaboration today so i am thankful to all the wonderful women and all the wonderful men around me who supported my journey uh, till this that date thank you dr bushra uh, for those who tuned in late uh, this was dr bushra rahim who is a deputy director of home and tribal affairs for the government in pakistan and also dr evangelin araselvi whitehead who is an associate professor of english and an associate professor in the college of education in saudi arabia uh, i'm dr ann gentino associate professor of education leadership millersville university of pennsylvania thank you 
so much to everyone who has joined us. We want to thank Steve Hargadon and Lucy Gray for this wonderful conference and allowing us to have a voice. And we hope that through us, that uh, girls' education, women's education will prosper and the leaders of those uh, educations will prosper. I've put our emails, all three of our emails in the chat for anyone who is seeing this either now or in the future, please do reach out to us. We would like to be collaborators with you and, and we hope that in some small way we've inspired or touched you today. Thank you so much.